Hello, I'm Michael F. Brown, President of the School for Advanced Research, and it is my great pleasure to host this event and welcome you to it, MacArthur Fellows in Conversation, featuring Jason DeLeon and Stephen Feld. This event is part of a partnership between the School for Advanced Research, Site Santa Fe, and the Center for Contemporary Arts in Santa Fe. You can learn more about Beyond, Beyond Borders and the partnership's upcoming programming on our website, sarweb.org. This con conversation was originally scheduled to take place at Site Santa Fe, but for obvious reasons, we're doing it remotely. Jason's in Pittsburgh, Stephen is on the SAR campus, and I'm at home. The event was made possible by the generous support of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, as well as the Santa Fe Community Foundation. I'd like to thank the staffs at SAR, SITE, and CCA for working tirelessly to pivot a whole complex series of programming from live to online to bring the events to the public during this pandemic. If you enjoy this event, please consider becoming a member of SAR, which offers a broad range of webinars and artist talks by Native American artists on subjects of broad public interest. Today's speakers are two of more than a dozen MacArthur Fellows who've been in residence at SAR for fellowship terms or seminars over the years. The two MacArthur Fellows you hear from today are both recognized for their exceptional contributions to the social sciences, albeit in different realms. Jason de Leon, SAR's 2013 Weatherhead Fellow, is the curator of Hostile Terrain 94, the installation that is now part of Site Santa Fe's exhibit called Displaced, which will open soon. You'll hear from, about the installation as part of this conversation today. Jason is a professor of anthropology and Chicano and Chicana studies at UCLA. His interests include archaeology, ethnophotography, and forensic science. He was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2017. Stephen Feld is a true polymath, a jazz trombonist, linguist, ethnomusicologist, and foremost practitioner of what has come to be called acoustic anthropology. He's taught at Columbia University, the University of Texas, NYU, and other institutions. He was named a MacArthur Fellow in 1991. Steve began working in Papua New Guinea's Bosabi region in 1976 and has dedicated much of his career to documenting the sounds and cultural dynamics of the area and its people. In 1991, he released an ambient soundscape album, Voices of the Rainforest, part of Mickey Hart's Endangered Music Project. In 2018, he released a full-length documentary by the same title, developed in part at SAR, that merged his audio archive with visuals from the rainforest and interviews with Basabi community members. Before we start, a brief note on format. Jason will begin his presentation first, followed by Steve, after which they'll engage in an informal conversation. At about the 40-minute mark, I'll join them so that we can respond to questions, which viewers can submit using the question line in their webinar control panel, which is off to the right of mo on most screens. We'll try to consider as many questions as possible, but I apologize in advance if we don't get to all of them. We'll close the event at around the 60 minute mark. Jason, let's begin with you. Hello everyone, um, it's really great to be here. Thank you SAR at Site Santa Fe and CCA Santa Fe for, for all your support. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with Steve uh, because I think that the two of us have had very similar um, career trajectories. Um, in relationship to how we we sort of view the connection between anthropology and art. Um, I'll just say quickly that um, I am the director of the Undocumented Migration Project, which is a long-term uh, anthropological research project slash arts collective slash educational program that is interested in documenting and highlighting the uh, experiences of, of migrants largely from Latin America into the United States. Uh, over the last probably seven or eight years, I've gone from being a, a relatively straightforward sort of anthropologist to someone who um, now wears many hats and, um, and, and titles. So our artist, curator, um, documentary filmmaker, uh, photographer. And for me, 
the strength of anthropology is its breadth, its, its holism, our ability to draw on the past, the present, um, to think about human biology, to think about language, to think about culture um, via ethnography, and also the, the, the past through, through archaeology. Um, I also think that there's a real strength in anthropology's ability to uh, engage with things like the arts. Um, and for me, it's crucial to try to translate the anthropological work that I'm doing for as many audiences as possible. Um, and I've sort of come to the point now where, where I'll wear the title of curator or artist, um, where I'm very comfortable now, I think, being referred to those things. But, you know, uh, early in my career, those were at times, I think, sort of uh, dangerous titles or titles that were used in sort of dismissive ways to talk about the work that I was interested in doing. Um, and I think we're in a different moment now that uh, uh, in terms of anthropology's relationship to the arts. And I'm very excited to to talk with, with Steve about uh, um, about this. Um, I'm just gonna give a, a, a little bit of some videos about the exhibition that we virtually launched last night and that is that is currently up in Santa Fe, um, Hostile Terrain 94, which will um, um, globally launch um, hopefully later this year or into next year. So I'm gonna show um, a, a couple of videos. The first is uh, an Associated Press uh, uh, news report from a prototype of the exhibition that we did uh, last year when I was teaching still at the University of Michigan. So I'm going to um, mute my video and, and let them start uh, video one. The exhibition is called Hostile Terrain 94 and it is a global participatory political art project whose goal is to raise awareness about America's humanitarian crisis at its southern border. We are um, basically conscripting people around the globe to spend an hour, half an hour, filling out toe tags for um, the dead, people who have been, whose bodies have been recovered in southern Arizona since about 2000. Um, and people are filling out these toe tags and then mounting them on a, giant, on a giant wall map of Arizona. We'll do it in 93 locations. And then after that, in mid-October, we will ask everyone to send back all of their toe tags. So over 300,000 toe tags will be mailed back to us. And our 94th installation will happen, we hope, within a, a few blocks of the White House in November of, of 2020. So It makes me really sad because actually my grandparents and my uncles came here illegally. So like knowing that at some point they could have been the ones that I could have been writing this about. I think it's really important because this is something that a lot of people do not like to talk about politically and honestly socially. You'll follow the header on the sheet. Immigration is such a hot topic um, in today's climate um, and we're talking about um, all these people who are coming over, like all these kids, um, child separation is huge right now, building a wall. Um, but no one's talking about the thousands of people that are dying um, on the border due to U.S. policy. Uh, so a few things obviously have changed since the recording of that video. Um, which I'm happy to talk about in, in the Q&A. Uh, we will be launching towards the end of this year in numerous locations around the globe um, at about 130 places. I wanna show one more video uh, related to the, the physical exhibition and that uh, revolves around an augmented reality uh, component that we've been developing with um, Alvaro Morales and Alex Suber, two of our collaborators. And so I'm gonna mute myself again and we're gonna show uh, a quick clip of this augmented experience that you can have with the exhibition that's accessed through um, through a cell phone and that highlights the, the voices of, of migrants themselves. Caminamos muchas, muchos días, pero llegamos bien, gracias a Dios. Muchas veces me agarraron, pero pues yo traté lo mismo de regresar para acá a Estados Unidos. So when um, when we have these physical exhibitions uh, opening, uh, they'll all be have um, embedded codes that you can hear the stories of people who have migrated. You can hear um, stories from the families of the disappeared and uh, people who have died in, in the desert as well. And 
all of our projects are deeply um, collaborative with with migrants and and uh, we have a um, you know one of our big missions is to is to put their voices at the forefront of these um, projects as, as much as humanly possible uh, and so um, the 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 last kind of thing I want to just show about this e exhibition re relates to the fact that we have put many things on pause because of COVID-19, um, but that doesn't mean that I think we still can't engage with one another uh, virtually and find ways to raise awareness about this issue. So what we're currently doing while we are in this moment of stasis with COVID-19 is trying to, to get 3,200 people um, from around the world to record 30 second videos of themselves reading off the name and information for someone who has died along the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona. This project is called um, Hostel 2094, A Global Remembrance, and we are currently still seeking, um, we, we, we need about 2,000 more people to, to finish this project, but I'm just going to play a little bit of a sample from it, and I would encourage anyone that's interested to um, to go to our website, hostelterrain94.org. You can get lots of information on the project and um, information about how to participate, and it, it takes about five minutes to um, to be involved and we would love to, to, to have your participation if possible. So I'm going to mute myself here and let, and let, and we'll play the. Name Bernardino Perez Salas, age 32. Reporting date, April 19th, 2010. Cause of death, heart disease. Name. Erlin Giovanni Hernandez Verde, age 22. Reporting date, 6-1-14. Cause of death, undetermined, due to skeletal remains. Name, Erica Torres Padilla, age 38. Reporting date, 16th of July, 2019. Cause of death, undetermined, due to skeletal remains. Name, Mariano Hernandez Roano, age 39. Reporting date, May 14, 2010. Cause of death, blunt force injury. Name, Margarito Escocia Franco, age 26. Reporting date, 06-13-02. Cause of death, exposure. Name, Jesus Ricardo Yanes Robles, age 29, reporting date 11-27-09, cause of death, gunshot wound. Nombre Pedro Xochicale Tlapalcoyo, edad 21 años, fecha del informe 4 de julio de 2003, causa de la muerte, exposición. Hugoberto Quiterio Vidal. 30 años. Fecha del reporte, 6-5-13. Causa de su muerte, inconcreta debido al estado que se encontraron los restos del esqueleto. Name, Marilio Gutierrez Perez. Age, 20. Reporting date, August 12, 2004. Cause of death, exposure. So we are going to um, collect those 3,200 recordings and then they will all be featured in our exhibition. So you'll be able to walk into an exhibition space and put on headphones or stand underneath a, um, a, sound, a sound tunnel and be able to hear um, what's gonna end up being 18 or 19 hours of audio of people reading out um, the names of the dead. So if you are interested, um, please uh, see our website for, for additional information. And I'm going to uh, pass the baton now, or the mic, to uh, to Steve, uh, and and mute myself. Hi, I'm Steve. Good afternoon. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here at SAR, uh, where I've been involved in many different ways over the years um, as a Santa Fe resident, as well as as a scholar and uh, participant and member. Uh, 
Like Jason, I am concerned and have long been concerned with uh, the possibility that anthropology could reach many audiences. And among the many audiences, uh, I also include uh, the principal importance of anthropology or any kind of research reaching the original population um, and the, the country, the people, uh, the area of original concern. So I started uh, uh, way back in the 70s in a kind of uh, classic way. I uh, was trained in linguistics and in cultural anthropology and in music. And uh, I did photographic exhibitions and I released an LP record uh, along with my first monograph. Uh, but at that time, uh, I think the field of anthropology was very different than it is now. And uh, as Jason hinted, uh, we really had to focus on writing that could reach uh, a scholarly audience rather than on writing that could reach multiple audiences and things like installations and films and sound recordings. Over the years, I tried to uh, shift the emphasis uh, away from writing books and articles as my main form of scholarly communication uh, and do more in the way of public speaking, more in the way of radio programs, more in the way of uh, different kinds of uh, integration of cassettes and uh, CD recordings uh, with writing uh, to try and make these things interact more. And uh, alongside that, I did the same thing with photographs and film. And uh, throughout all of this, I also experienced uh, the importance of doing feedback with all of these media uh, in Papua New Guinea, where I was working with a very small population of rainforest dwellers, people who call themselves Bosavi, who live in South Central Highlands of Papua New Guinea. And uh, as Michael mentioned, um, this uh, work went to a much larger audience when Grateful Dead drummer Mickey Hart um, got the band to support a, uh, a CD. Uh, and uh, at that time in the world music market, there was a lot of concern with uh, exposing the world to different kinds of musics. And I had a different idea. I wanted to expose the world to what people in the rainforest hear 24 hours a day and why listening is so important to them, why they know so much about their world, their dense visual world through sound. And the cosmology of that world, the ecology of that world, the poetry of that world, the songs of that world are all very deeply connected. And over uh, the 25 years that I was principally working, I recorded a thousand of these songs and found that in them, there were 7,000 or more uh, names of places. And I began going up in helicopters and putting these on GPS maps um, uh, as things started to heat up in Papua New Guinea and oil and mining and resource extraction companies began to uh, be concerned with access to the rainforest. And I realized that the knowledge of these places, the knowledge of the ecology of the forest uh, was as important as the notion that the forest is a spiritual home of the ancestors and that when people listen to birds or insects or water they're also listening to ancestral voices so i'm going to show you two video clips because the most recent iteration of a project to translate this kind of research uh, to as many audiences as i can was working collaboratively with bosavi people to uh, to make a film, uh, and the film represents in 70 minutes, uh, 24 hours of the day, and you hear the activities of work and leisure and ritual. And uh, in the song that you're going to hear in this first clip, um, a woman is singing in a creek, and um, she maps the relationship between her family, the places along the creek, and she sings a song uh, which lists many features of this world. And it's simultaneously an ecological, cosmological, and uh, politically powerful map. And I'll tell you a thing about that um, after we watch the video.
So in that clip, you heard a woman named Dulahi who's been one of my principal teachers since 1975 uh, in the domain of song poetics. And she sings a map, which is about her family, uh, relates to where her pigs live, the intersection of waters and lands. But it's also uh, a story that's told from a bird's point of view, from the point of view of her feet walking that land and the point of view of her memories, what kinds of images come into her mind when she hears that song or when she thinks of those places or hears those names. And so uh, we tried to fuse the bird's point of view with drone photography and the walking images and uh, old images, mental images, and bring all these things together to create a different kind of poetic uh, translation. Um, and one that would be close to the experiential world of Ulahi and Bosavi people. And when she finished singing that song, um, she spontaneously sang the second one that you heard, 
the one that refers to American men and Australian women. And afterwards, she said to me, I feel very sad. Uh, the people in your place, they don't know our place names. They don't know the names of our trees, the kinds of clouds we see, the kinds of birds we have, the things we hear here. So I thought, well, maybe if I sing a song with the words America or Australia, people will understand what these songs are about. Um, and uh, without any prompting, that was, I think, a, a really brilliant intervention on Ulahi's part and to question people and ask, what are your names? Because that's the world that connects us uh, as listeners and as viewers with uh, the experiences of Bosavi people. And these songs uh, become politically and socially more and more important, the old ones, the new ones, uh, as there's more and more contestation over the 500 square miles of land that 2,000 Bosavi people live on. So like Jason, I'm concerned with how we bring the world of experience and the world of human dignity to the critical questions of right now and the anthropology of what it means to stand uh, in and with people uh, during humanitarian crisis and during the crisis of environmental uh, wreckage. And uh, I'm gonna play you just one more clip now. And this is the last three minutes of the film. And um, this is uh, meant to be a link between the, the 24 hours day in the life in Bosavi and the film that I'm working on now, which is called The New Voices of the Rainforest, which is about the children and grandchildren of people like Ulahi and what their world is like today and how those questions, uh, the questions that are raised in the poetry of the songs of their parents and grandparents now uh, circulate in a new and different way. So we'll watch this uh, clip of a, of a woman uh, who would be at the age of uh, Ulai's granddaughter, and her name is Monica. Niwi o Monica, tuwa wi a digilo, ni bonoka. Sidi fuki. Bona Surib and a Sami Mirabu. Ena Yesegi and a Sidikio. K say Yalin Digi and Ami Nidu any Ao Yubido Ami and a Feder Mania Mirabu. Ena Feder Meniani and a Sinamio. K Amugonu and Adabu. Amu Obe Amugonu and Ade de Segio. Ye and Oba Leriki Minawa Modabu Bebe. Ena Dabu Bedabu Kio. Nawa Yubi Serakio. Hino Sedaga Neresio. Hina use daga ne desi no iye nudo seraki yo o the voices of the rainforest ere do wiki re no iye na ena di robu wi ena ena di obe me yo honi si me ni gabo obe me seresin o suwa wo karu o su me ni gakere bo obe me seresin o karu magi so wo ayami fere me gakere bo obe me seresin. See yo, I give you a meal. See ya, see me yak at a ball. Obey me, Seresin. Ella Sinami. I'm in missing yo. And I yes again. I'm missing radio and I didn't yabby. I obey go no where the Seresin no back eh. We care, Serabi. Missing is right. We care, Serabi here. Only real radio war. And I did say, I mean, Connell Suman war. Suo Semin and war. Already in a sass of the sin. Or Cosumi and war. Ready in a sass of the sin. Wala fe amiro karu wala fa wala fe amre dine ni wo already na seresin ele sure di gire no already no kamu gagabi already o kamu gagai already amre badiri re kamu gagai jabi ela biki yo misi ni ni mo gwe ka bi odi mina re sio radio ni mo gwe ka di mina re sio o misi ni ni de si ni mo de da ka ka di sabi o mu gagabi no ko mere se ke ka di sabi o sabi no no gamani radio ni re di mina re sio Ne mada halai da ke ne wala fka rukolo wala fya mire saga ife nwo ye mina re de semen wo kozu kolo semen eno ne halai da ke radio ni re di mina re sio gamani mo o gamani mo soro de fuo o gamani re modi mi abi o re sabi no no kambani mo kambani o welo ni re ami bo saro biki radio ni re di mina re sio e re de soro de fuo o kambani re ni mo beda bi ni mo nu fura bi e la biki o radio no o mu ka gigi sa ka de sabi ki yo 
ni keri no kari yaki ni yo sambu keri no kari yaki waka semeni wo wala kari wi wala fa yami waka rigi feni wo ko shi wo minari de semeni waka semeni wo ni do wo ele di mi do iyo america karu karu mo sere sege kono miri mo sere sege mada ele tugo ki de wami yo ma su fero ibo koro ni an suru wi yo giyo mada ta wa yo this is a ta wa yo ni bona ami seni wi na mi yo mada bi ye kuma ki ya a suru ni da a suru wo om So that's just a, for me, a very powerful example of how the young generation of people in Bosabi uh, can summarize uh, in three minutes uh, what is the 60 years of uh, their history since independence, uh, the onslaught of the missionaries and the presence of the government, uh, the presence of oil and mining companies and how uh, they imagine that right now they are becoming more remote not more connected to the world, even though they have considerably more knowledge of the world and more access. So this, uh, this doubly remote uh, kind of reality is what uh, is going to be addressed in the, in the film coming up and uh, to try and link the voices of the rainforest of uh, the generation of Monica's grandparents like uh, Ulahi, and the generation, uh, her generation, and the generation of her children coming. I think uh, with that uh, little introduction, I can ask Jason to come back online here and we could start the conversation. Um, uh, Jason, I just wanna say that I, your, your project is deeply moving and powerful um, for me and uh, aside from just saying congratulations and uh, uh, I wanted to see if we could kick this off by asking each other or kind of sounding out a little bit a, a more general question around these things and that is you know you've moved into film you've moved into doing stuff with sound and voices with graphics with objects with installations and things like that but you're also uh, a very committed writer and I remain a very committed writer. And so at some point I'd like to talk about writing, but maybe um, I'd really like to ask you, I was really uh, brought into the thoughts about the world of the young people who are participating in this project when I saw your videos and your installation. And um, uh, I'm not teaching now, I'm retired, but you are teaching. What's it like uh, you know, to work with this younger generation and get them involved, not just into a project about art and activism, but a project where they can use the full, full tools of anthropology, the full you know, historical record, biological record, archeological record, to bring these very powerful realities um, like the, the migration story, into the into the public eye, because it seems that you know if we follow this to where it really goes, it means that our responsibility now is to skill all of our students and to ask all of our colleagues uh, not just to be good writers, but also to work with the full range of media available uh, to uh, bring out what's most important about anthropology today. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, uh, I think I could ask you the same question very slightly differently. Like, you know, um, you know, I think I've I've looked to you and others who were really trailblazing in terms of fighting against the status quo and making an argument that uh, anthropology didn't all have to look the same. Um, you know, I I, I think um, when I talk to students now about this and they say, well. You know, how do you do this kind of stuff? And I say, well, it was really miserable for many years doing this stuff. Um, it was really difficult. And you you find yourself constantly having to ex explain your work to people who don't understand it. You're evaluated by people who have no business evaluating the things that you're doing because they don't have the, the, the literacy to do it. Um, and I think now when I talk to these students, I'm really inspired by them because I think that, um, in a lot of ways, 
they don't see the divisions between the subdisciplines or the division between social science and the humanities like like my generation did or, or, or previous generations. And so I think they come with a lot of optimism and openness. And the way that I sort of work with them, especially the ones who want to go into academia, I say, you know, and this is, and no one really said this to me when I was doing it, but I just kind of figured it out along the way. And that was like, okay, these are the metrics that I've been, you know, the, the first I'll say, there are no metrics for tenure. And then they'll whisper in your ear and they'll go, you got to write the book, you got to get this grant, you got to publish in these particular journals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and anything else you do outside of that is, you know, sort of cute. We like it. But if you don't do these other things, you're not going to get sort of tenure. Um, mm -hmm. And I had to really make a case going up for tenure that all these things that I was doing, the exhibition work and, and other stuff that wasn't a, a journal article or a book uh, were valuable and shouldn't be thought of as, you know, they were they were core to my mission and not this extraneous kind of, you know, icing on the cake. And so I think what my students now, what I tell them is I say, look, don't be like me. I was someone who was told that being an artist, being a musician, being concerned about writing and fiction and words, that those were things that were going to get in the way with, of me writing a journal article or being a professor kind of thing. And so I tell my students now to try to, to blend their passions and to do it in a way that is not going to take away from the things that they're expected to do if they're, they want to be successful, um, but 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 also they can use it to um, to to make a a case that the stuff that they're doing is core to to their work. And so whether that's you know poetry, writing, filmmaking, that that's a, a key component to their anthropology. And if they start early enough and and build it in. I think it's easier in the long run to kind of justify it as opposed to like trying to tack it on at the end. And so I, I tell them to kind of start thinking early on, how do you blend all these things that you're passionate about into a, a sort of cohesive package that then can be understandable to um, a wider audience? Mm -hmm. I think that um, that's really what you say is very important because, uh, and, and it resonates a lot with me because uh, the issue I think for all of us is how do we make the critical issues of right now legible for different readers and and different viewers and and different participants how do we in, inspire and encourage other people to realize that the story of the human past and the human present the story that links indigenous people uh, the story of colonialism the stories of you know race and gender and power and all of the things that we've written endless books about um, that these also have this very sensorial, very experiential, very close up kind of dimension. And that if we are skilled with sound and music and images and different uh, genres of writing um, and film, we have a much better uh, possibility to actually do anthropology in the most complete way. And, you know, I'm reminded that. Um, uh, each generation is uh, I, exactly as you say. Each generation is forced to, you know, reinvent this in a certain kind of way. But the ancestral generations in anthropology who did museum exhibits and who saw themselves as, you know, fighters against, um, you know, racism, or who who saw themselves advocating for various kinds of concerns, and who understood that uh, that. Anthropology really stretched a long way, connecting the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Um, they all were forced to do exactly what you and I have done, and you know, write well, write a good book, and then you know, people will maybe bother you less, and you know, and good luck, see if you can stretch it out, and maybe we'll be successful with the you know with the next generation. Um, uh, with uh, skilling them to really take this into a different place where they might start with images and then move to text or start yeah. with sounds and then move to images or, you know, feel that they can move comfortably to weave these no forms of knowledge production together. No, no. And I, and I just try to, you know, set an example so students can see that, look, there's many different pathways to do ethnography, to do anthropology. Um, and if, you know, if you want to take it in one of those directions, don't be deterred by the gatekeepers in the academy who typically, you know, 
who don't know how to evaluate film or who think making photographs are easy. You know, I, I tell students like if people are putting up roadblocks for the type of work that you want to do, then you need to find new people to engage with. You need to you need to try to develop a community that's going to be supportive of what you want to do. And unfortunately, that might not even be within anthropology, right? You might have to go elsewhere to have these conversations. Um, and it took me a long time to realize that too. I mean, I um, uh, I was having a conversation with a colleague at, um, at at BU a couple of years ago, and I was sort of complaining about how I really wanted um, my colleagues at um, my previous institution to sort of come together to have these interesting sort of conversations about things that I that I was really passionate about. And he kind of jokingly said to me, he's like, well, um, you know, I think about my department as a, a, they pay me and they promote me, but they don't necessarily facilitate the best conversations that I want to have. And this was someone who had invited me to this interdisciplinary workshop that he had brought people from all across campus that he wanted to, to converse with, um, mm -hmm. you know, who aren't anthropologists. And it was just um, when I finally realized that, like, oh, you know, I really can gain so much by by just even taking myself out of this out of this pigeonhole and and trying to find out these other these other interesting people um, that was really uh, for me eye-opening and I find now that you know I have so many conversations with non-anthropologists about anthropology that um, I wish that someone earlier on had had kind of you know clued me into to that because I felt like I really had bought into this idea that that I was in a disciplinary box and I had to and I had to stay there I mean so I tell the students now I'm like you need to go out on into campus and you need to find people who are in other places who who understand what you want to do because they're the ones that are going to push your work and are going to and more importantly they're the ones who are going to be really supportive of that of those directions i'm really struck by how the classic issues of social justice of previous generations and my generation and your generation you know in some ways facilitate the best in anthropology in the sense that all those old classic questions like what could it possibly mean to be and feel and experience what someone else does you know those classic questions about humanity are really we're able to raise them in these new and more and you know i think in some ways quite more powerful ways now as a result of you know engaging with these with these media and uh, particularly with uh, things like the kind of collaborative practice that you described well you know I, I i don't know if 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 you're feeling this but i feel like this like we're in these kind of dark times right now right the world is on fire a million different ways and i've been really inspired by the students who are coming out and saying i want to do anthropology but i want to do an anthropology that has reach and i want to do an anthropology that's um that is not going to be siloed in in the academy and so i think that people are taking inspiration from the dark Kind of times that we're in but but on the other side of that people who i think anthropologists who who i know who historically had been very dismissive of public anthropology or dismissive of these sort of public facing projects that weren't you know that if it's not a book or not a journal article they didn't think it was something that was a value suddenly now all of them are you know realizing that hey we have so many experts on these issues and why are we continuing to just have conversations with ourselves um, when we know that that we have the most to say about things like race and inequality and and structure and and all of these things, and so um, I'm even seeing some of the old guard now who were dismissive of me 10 years ago, um, starting to kind of see the, the you know the, the importance of 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 trying to engage with 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 publics in different ways now. Yeah. Um, Michael Brown is somewhere in the background, and before we get much further because I think you and I could rattle on for a really long time. <laughs> Let me ask Michael if he, if there are questions that are floating around or if he wants to intervene here. And, and yeah, there are not a lot of questions you, coming in. I've got some specific ones for, for Jason, but before we get to that, um, so one of the things that I'm struck by, well, as part of the sort of anti-racist movement of the time, uh, of our time, the whole question of objectivity you know and this comes out of post-structuralist post-modernist thinking is you know held up as not only ridiculous but potentially racist um and yet and both of you have work that do work that has act, elements of activism um and that's that's documenting injustice and yet you're both committed to fact-based field work so 
I mean, in deep, deep field work uh, in, in different ways. Um, and it kind of, Jason's is a sort of archaeology of the present. And Steve, you've got a, you know, a long sort of 40, 50 year transect of involvement with Bosabi people. Um, so how do you, how do you find that sweet spot where you, you commit yourself to an activist dimension, but you still are embedded in a world of, of knowledge that's systematically acquired, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. You know, uh, I talk to some people these days who actually think it's kind of suspicious uh, when I say I'm, I'm really uh, as interested in poetry and poetics and the aesthetic dimension of society uh, as I was 50 years ago. And they say things like, well, there's no time now for aesthetics and that's all, you know, kind of super structural fluff. Uh, we have to really concentrate on these, you know, critical matters of now. And I think um, it's just important to say that um, the poetics of a world like Bosabi are grounded in every aspect of political economy. They're grounded in every aspect of, of, of history. They're grounded in everything from the cosmological system um, to the mythological system to the agricultural cycles. The, I mean, and unless you know, and unless you care to know about these things, then you can't really in any way uh, honestly collaborate with the people to represent what it is they're on about and what they want the world to know about them. Given the opportunity to have some voice, what kind of voice do they really want to have? What do they want people to know about who they are and where they are? So um, I think that it's, you know, I, I like Jason, um, with his commitment to objects and archaeology and to the, 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 the materiality of the past and the present, I'm also... I, for me, things like words and poetry and ideas are just as material as any of those, anything that's found on the ground. I mean, these are really the material facts of Bosabi history. And um, so I, and I, and I, I feel that it's necessary to, you know, pass on to younger generation that um, uh, this is what it means to collaborate with people, to bring their world uh, to a bigger world. Yeah, and I, you know, this question about about activism. I don't really call myself an activist. Um, I I didn't really begin. Well, I, I foolishly began my project over a decade ago, thinking that it was an apolitical project because I was an archaeologist and and I had been trained that that archaeology was completely like there was no politics in archaeology, and so of course I had to unlearn many 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 bad things. Um, and and get smart about the way the world actually works, um, but you know I, I I never kind of set off and say I'm doing activist kind of work. I think you know the world is is a difficult, oftentimes violent place, and I think it's it's hard to do ethnography um, and not just come up against those things all the time, um, even if you're not looking for them. And so you know I started gravitating towards difficult questions around immigration and migration and borders and was so um, just like devastated by the things that I was seeing that I wanted other people to kind of know about it too. And I, you know, and, and I wanted to try to, to educate them about what the world looks like for, for people like, like migrants. And, you know, I think about the, the exhibition work is that's just me trying to connect with people who don't want to read ethnographies, who aren't going to watch a, a film, you know, some new kind of audience who I want to share anthropological knowledge with. Um, it just happens to then, I think, fit into some people's kind of idea of, oh, well, then that must be activism because you are engaging with the public and you're, and you're raising awareness about these difficult kinds of things. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm really suspicious of anthropology that doesn't in, try to engage with the public or raise awareness about the difficulties of the world. Um, and so, and the same thing when people talk about like a public anthropology, um, and I say, well, what's the opposite of that, right? Are you, people who aren't doing public anthropology, what kind of anthropology is it that you're actually doing? Um, so it's a, I, I have a weird relationship with that, um, with that term, but, but I'm fully committed to, you know, to doing social science as best I can. 
um, even if the results and the data come back and they're not what I was hoping for, um, you know, because I think it's such a, you know, and I'll, like, I think one example was with the forensic work that we've done on migrant death. And I had a, a journalist once come and take a picture of these experiment, experiments we had been doing in the desert um, with these pig, um, pigs that we had been using as proxies for human bodies. And all that was left in one of these experiments, we had dressed up a pig in this, and then it, it had been killed on site and then consumed by vultures. All that was left was the head and the sneakers. And they were in the place where they had been, you know, the rest of the body was completely missing, but the head hadn't moved, nor the sneakers. And the reporter said to me, wow, you really staged this picture. You know, this is a pretty macabre kind of way to stage this thing. And I just said to him, like, why would I do that? You know, number one, I'm, a, you know, I'm a, I, I believe in science um, and I believe in data and I would never want to have people, I mean, they're already questioning my motives because of my identity, because uh, they don't like my politics perhaps, but I never want them to question the, like, the rigorousness of the methods. Um, and so I, I always feel like activism sometimes when you, when you pair it with like social science, people tend to think, oh, well, maybe you're, you're, you're cooking the books a little bit to, to do, you know, to, to further your own agenda. And, um, you know, so that's why I think I get a little suspicious about that. We've got a, a specific question from Helen, but I think maybe we can make it a little bit more general. So the question is, are there any current migrant oral history projects happening with the Hostile Terrain Exhibition? Are there any oral histories being documented at this time locally or globally? So, which then ties into the question of um, how, you know, how do people get to speak for themselves? Um, on the one hand, you, you your project, well, of course, you know, you, you, you've gone to considerable trouble, Jason, to track down the surviving families of some of the people. We, did, we didn't really talk about that, but it's a very moving part of the project. Um, Steve obviously has uh, is working on a, a movie in which people speak for themselves um, about what they want, what they need, what they see, what they feel. Um, wh what are the possibilities as well as the dilemmas of, of that kind of research? or project, I guess I would call it. Um, you know, it's, I try as many ways as I can to get people involved and to, to find um, ways for them to express themselves. Um, not everybody's comfortable, I think, you know, expressing themselves in, in those in those formats. So that's always a challenge. Um, but then also, you know, at the end of the day too, the other issue is that, you know, you have to, you're the editor at the end or you're the producer, you get, you get to decide what is included and what is not. And so that's always, I think, um, a, a challenge too, is you get all these voices and then you want everyone to have kind of equal stay, but at the end of the day, like anything, you have to make some editorial decisions about what 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 stays and what gets cut. So I think that's another, um, an, another challenge. I think that, um, you know, uh, the question of voice can be literal, but it's also, um, extensively not so literal. I mean, uh, people speaking directly is one kind of testimony, and I don't think uh, Jason's work in any way um, reduces uh, experience to witnessing and testimony or reduces anthropology to witnessing and testimony. There are some people who feel that anthropology would be more successful if it was more journalistic in that kind of way. Um, but that is, you know, that takes a big risk. That asks us to take what people say or what we edit of what people say in some kind of transparent way. And I think what Jason's on to and what has always, you know, guided me is that uh, for every quotation you give, you know, you're going to have to, uh, you know, spend a lot of time unwrapping a number of different kinds of contexts, whether they're historical, material, counter voices, um, you know, all of the different ways that uh, different kinds of witnessing are now embedded um, in, in very contested uh, views of, of history. Uh, I remember very clearly in, in 2000, uh, the Smithsonian asked me to put together a box set of CD recordings and a book um, reviewing 25 years of my research in the rainforest. And I discussed it with the people in Bosavi and what was emerging in the 90s was a whole new kind of music, a whole new generation of musicians. 
the first generation of people in the rainforest who played guitars and ukuleles. And what was really interesting to me was that, you know, even though I thought the elders would say, well, you start out uh, with the ritual music and then you have the everyday music and then, you know, maybe you, you put some of this at the end. Everybody thought that it was really cool. <laughs> that There was this new music. There was the birth of a new music. And in fact, that became the first CD in the box set. The second CD was the music of everyday life. And the third CD was the ritual music of the grandparental generation. So there are always these surprises. And but I think, you know, these are really questions of historical context and what you do about contexting the, the notion of voice. Yeah, well, some of that, of course, comes from long-term engagement, which you certainly have, and I'm sure J Jason's too young to have that super long period, but someday he will. I, I was just mindful of when I worked in the Upper Amazon with the Awahoon, the time I did a lot of that work in the mid to mid 70s to the late 80s, there was almost no um, people were not taking hallucinogens, were not taking ayahuasca, which had been a part of traditional culture. And it just seemed to be dead. And when I came back 15 years ago for a visit, the vision quest had been reinstated, but it was to get a vision of whether they could go to college. It wasn't a vision of, you know, whether they could defend themselves against their hidden enemies. It was like, can I get a job, you know, and they would see mm -hmm. uh, under the, you know, the influence of, of ayahuasca, their, their future in that sense. So you just never know. I mean, it's people mm -hmm. are surprising and um and that long-term perspective is something that journalists almost never have. It's that long 30, 40, 50 year commitment to a place and a people that really makes a difference. Um, we've got two great questions and we we'll probably have to end after that. Um, Lisa asks, can you speak together to the place of memory and memorialization in your multimodal projects? What's hard about it? What's essential about it? Your process for representing and embodying it. Wow, it's a, it's a big question. <laughs> Uh, obviously, Jason, you thought a lot about how, you know, you would memorialize and embody um, the tragic deaths in the desert um, using the toe tags on a map. Um, what other kinds of ways are you thinking about to make that leap? I know Steve has some ideas about that, too. Um, you know, it's trying to find ways for, for it to kind of live on. I mean, that's and I think that's one of the issues with with the exhibition space, right, is that it just, it's a temporary kind of thing. And, um, you know, we're experimenting right now with the creation of a virtual, like an online exhibition that will draw together all of the stuff from 130 plus locations, oral histories, testimonials, um, artwork, and other pieces from each of these places that we'll, we'll collate into one. Um, we also just got a grant to do a metal sculpture version of the, toe tag wall or at least a, a starter grant so we're going to try to 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 cast 3200 toe tags in metal um and to create a permanent a permanent exhibition we we're, we're looking right now for for uh, for more money to do it um and a, a space to permanently hold it but thinking about that could be this kind of permanent monument to this thing that would then just grow as unfortunately as as people are um could continue to die um but you know with, with the memory stuff i mean it's um it's it's always a challenge and i think one of the things that we try to do is is to ask people you know to to have conversations with with the families of the of the missing families of of the deceased with migrants about what are the things that they think would be useful for for it going into the future and um you know those conversations for us are, are super important and they're not always you know oftentimes they're unexpected i mean i think i, I learned a long time ago that um that I don't know much about anything and um, it keeps being reinforced the more I ask people questions because they just blow my mind all the time. And so we really look to to the, the stakeholders to help us, you know, develop ideas that then how do we move into the future and maintain, you know, the, the memory of this in a in a um, in a productive and, um, you know, healthy, respectful way. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. And uh, to pile on a little bit, you know, I think that. Um, this emphasis on names and naming um, and on the um, idea that names are the basically the machinery of memory, the machinery of keeping things ongoing, keeping things resonant, 
um, whether it's the sound of a bird or the sound of a human voice or the name of a place or the name of a tree. Um, experimenting with these new modes of visualization using drone cameras to track birds uh, uh, based on what people have explained and taught to me or uh, just filming people walking the everyday paths as well as the special ones. Um, linking up all these names of people and names of places uh, like the toe tags and like the name, you know, stating, having people state and speak out the names of individuals and to get those names into their bodies, into their voices, to make them resonant, to make them repeatable, to make it important to repeat them. Uh, this is the critical thing. and. Um, in uh, 1993, after I had recorded uh, some of Ulahi's songs, and particularly this one, uh, What Are Your Names? Um, I played that at a conference in Canada, at a, a conference called The Tuning of the World. It was mostly radio soundscape artists who were there. Uh, and I was, I think, probably the lone anthropologist invited to talk about what I was doing uh, in radio at that time uh, with anthropological uh, work together with indigenous people and using indigenous radio and indigenous radio stations. And uh, people were very moved by that song. And uh, about six months after the conference, I received a cassette recording in the mail with uh, 200 people just saying their name. And uh, one of the conference organizers uh, had been very moved by the song and did that. And I took that back to Papua New Guinea and played it for people and they were just so totally blown away. But this really gets to what Jess Jason is saying. What does it mean not just to start a conversation, but to imagine all of the <laughs> layers of resonance that you're gonna, you know, gonna get something and get it going? Because memory is not just a project of of the past. Memory is a, a you know a kind of work that we do to you know link the the, the sounding and being of those voices and presences with our own. The last question is a great one, I think, to end on because this project, for this project, SAR is partnering with two terrific art institutions in Santa Fe, uh, the CCA and Site Santa Fe. So Tony asks, I'd love to hear more about the reach of art for both of you. Uh, what is the work that art is doing to expand the reach of anthropology? Put another way, how are your aesthetic and artistic concerns changing the way scholars can engage multiple publics? That's a great question. Um, you know, I I think for the longest time I thought that that art, my art, my interest in things like writing and music uh, had nothing to do with being a social scientist, had nothing to do with anthropology. And um, I think it wasn't until I got, you know, the kind of burnout that one has towards the, like going up for tenure, where my last year I was working on a book, I was so fed up with everything. Um, and I decided that the, that my last kind of big step was I had to write a book. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I've written a lot of journal, like writing for me up to that point had been miserable. Like I hated writing. I was never trained to, to write. Uh, you know, I was trained to write a certain way, but it wasn't a very pleasant way. And, and no one ever said to me, be kind to your reader kind of thing. And so I thought, oh my God, if I have to write a hundred thousand words, that's like 10 brutal articles that are going to just be painful. Um, to me, to the reader. And so I just decided, okay, I want to go back to reading. I want to go back to fiction. And I want to go back to thinking about song lyrics and about music and about how um, those things have, have long inspired other parts of my life. And I thought, well, if I'm going to write a book now, I want to write something that is readable and that relates, that connects to these things that have long inspired me. And so I kind of had to rethink my whole relationship to writing. And then once I got into that, I realized like, oh my God, the things that I've always loved really make this a more interesting kind of project. And um, and once I kind of recognized that, then I said to myself, okay, post tenure, I want to just do whatever I want to do now. And and what I want to do happens to involve engaging with art in all kinds of ways. And um, it really was life changing for me. And I find it to be so inspiring. I you know when people talk about who are my big influences, 
it's it's typically not other anthropologists. It's a lot of artists, um, you know, music writers. Those are the people that I'm looking to to inform um, the my, my my practice. And I think now we're in a we're in a great moment to be doing that and um, and doing it in so many different ways. But for me, you know, I'll never go back. Um, now that I've been kind of freed up by by tenure and other various things um, to be the artist that I want to be. I find that now to be s such an inspiring kind of place and one that, um, uh, you know, I'll never, never again in my, have I thought, oh God, I got to write this thing or I got to do this work thing because I, I can infuse it with art. And for me, that's both personally inspiring, but also I think it's a way for me to connect with, with people beyond the academy. Steve? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, if you would have told me 40 years ago that, you know, that I would be teaching classes where I would be telling students, okay, this passion that you have for this data, for this problem, for this issue, for these theories, and things like that, you know, just forget about writing for a minute. You know, imagine you're a really, really good singer songwriter. What are you going to do with this data set? You know, like make the best song you could possibly make out of it. You know, how are you going to connect? How could you connect with people that way? Or just any kind of exercise like that, which is a typical art school exercise to get you to work outside of the medium in which you're most comfortable. If you're a painter, you know, how are you going to sculpt that idea or whatever? Just take the kinds of exercises that all of us have been to art school and you know been are familiar with art process take those things and really you know find ways to reimagine an anthropological practice um, through that and to think about what is legibility what matters what is it that we really you know want to get across and i think you know artists uh you know develop particular kinds of articulateness with being able to get tremendous amounts of feelings and ideas across or into the air with very focused sets of materials. And sometimes we rely as social scientists too much on how much information we have and how broadly we can spread it out rather than think about how do we get right to it, you know? It's like, you know, um, when, when Laurie Anderson took the electrical plate on the wall and turned that little smiley face into, you know, something that connects electricity in the face. And when Jason takes the toe tag and connects, you know, lives past and present, you know, the feelings of people now wanting to engage with these stories and ask why and where and how did this happen? And those lost lives, you know, this is this is the kind of thing that's necessary now to really you know like think about the transposition of our deepest feelings and our deepest thoughts and our deepest ways of knowing as social scientists at this other at these other material levels whether it's a song or you know uh, some a graphic or a tag that somebody fills out or a name that somebody speaks well, thank you both for a very memorable, memorable conversation. Um, I can say to our viewers, if you have a chance to see uh, Hostel Train 94 at Site Santa Fe, or if you're not in the in the Southwest at one of the many other places that will be opening in the coming year or so, it's worth your time. And Steve's uh, Voices of the Rainforest video is one of the most immersive Audi especially auditory experiences that you can have in documentary film. Uh, it's probably the most sophisticated audio track ever created for a documentary film, and it's really amazing. Um, so thanks to you both, and we'll check out now. Thanks to everyone who participated in this event. Great questions, and uh, I look forward to seeing you both. Uh, Jason, safe trip home to L.A. when you uh, do that, and Steve, I'll be seeing you here in town, I hope. Thanks, Thank you. Michael. Thank you, Jason. Thank you both. Thank you, Steve. Sure.